and the English. And I, I knew the first place that I was in your state, but I didn't know about it. Came yeah. She became a rock star. <laughs> Seconds remaining in your presentation. Please stick to this time limit because it's running over your life. Time will affect the rest of the presentations in the session. Um, today, we are also fortunate to be joined by a graphic illustrator who will illustrate the practices throughout the session. Each demo session will be scored based on several criteria, including the innovativeness of the solution, its impact and the overall delivery of the presentation. These scores will be used to determine the recipients of the VHA Innovation Experience Demo Awards. Winners will be announced at the award ceremony on Wednesday, October 23rd at 4.30 p.m. All right, sorry for my sniffing. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. And our first presenter, are Wayne White and Timothy Womack from VA Central Office or Central Ohio Healthcare System presenting on 3D printer program. Good evening, my name is William White, I'm a retiree, and as you heard, I work in Columbus, Ohio. Good afternoon, I'm Timothy Womack. I also received I'm in Columbus VA. <laughs> what we want to talk to you today about is our 3D printing program. As you already know, there's a lot of VAs that use the 3D printing program, but we're the only VA in the country that use veterans to operate our 3D printing program. And what we'd like to do is just tell you a little bit about some of our veterans. Well, I just want to understand most veterans, if not all, have some sort of deficit or an obstacle. Such as myself, I suffered from a stroke at an early age and discharged early, and it left me uncertain as to what I wanted to do in my career until I met up at this world point and got involved in this 3D printing program. What the 3D printing program has done is it's given veterans that didn't even know how to operate a computer to learn how to operate a computer, learn how to operate the program Fusion 360. They can take apart the 3D printer itself. They can actually now print something that they've designed their own. They even know how to design it. But they've learned all of this through this program. In this process, I've gotten the opportunity to meet a lot of great people in and through the VA and also work with a nonprofit organization, Low Tech Heroes, which showed us the ropes on how to use this equipment and be more efficient on our own as veterans and learn the new trade to take into society. 
What excites me about this program is that with the veterans, they have learned that they can literally do whatever their imagine, imagination can come. And what we've had is we've got this one veteran who got tired of the sock monster. Everybody here knows about the sock monster. You put your socks in a white machine, you go to get your stuff off the dryer, you've only got one sock. The rest of the socks are gone. You're like, where did the socks go? Well, this veteran says, I'm going to defeat the sock monster. And he created the sock saver. You put the socks through the hole, you throw it in the washing, you throw it in the dryer. Guess what? The sock monster has been defeated and the veteran is victorious. <laughs> <laughs> These projects range from the sock saver all the way up to the eye clinic and right because of prosthetics, we've gotten the opportunity to work with different departments as far as radiology, um, logistics, I'm sorry, um, all the way down to our food service programs and we've got just gotten a basic opportunity to recreate and possibly help our VA cut down on small costs and provide a new way for veterans like myself with deficits and of course the of source to actually learn something new and bring something to other veterans. So our hope today is that you will pick us because what this is doing is this is actually taking a veteran who might have nothing, might have different thoughts that they're not going to move anywhere because of criminal, physical, or mental health issues, and now they have a goal. They can become something. So our sale to you today is to go out and let the 3D printing be something that your veterans can grow from and that you can expand to help their lives get better. We thank you for your time. Thank you, William and Timothy. Great job. Uh, so next we have David Hook and Timothy Strebel from Vision 22 Desert Pacific Healthcare Network presenting Foresight. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Hook, and I am here with Tim Strobel on behalf of our team to present Foresight. Uh, Foresight is a Windows application <laughs> developed by VA employees that automates the ordering and console management process for high classes. Our prosthetic service lines for Vision 22 and 23 uh, came together and collaborated on this project when during the FY 2017 console stand down. We recognize that eyeglass consults are consistently exceeding our time limits monitors, and we want to do something about that. <clears throat> so our team, Spencer, Brian, Tim, myself, and a lot of others brought together a really unique blend of talents, business knowledge, process improvement, and rock coding power, and just solved this problem. Um, and uh, we brought it to a commodity group that represents 30% of the individual purchase orders placed by prosthetics across the Veterans Health Administration. So Foresight is capable of automating most high glass orders across the prosthetics and sensory aid service. It completes the console while transmitting intact in order to the vendor, and this reduces or actually completely eliminates errors in transcription or transmission that were very present in the <coughs> process. In addition to that, uh, it eliminates the workload of the individual purchase orders and allows the staff who are doing that to reinvest their time providing other prosthetic appliances to others, which reduces wait time and increases access. Finally, it allows us to decentralize the eyeglass process while improving visibility and accountability for every single order. So Foresight has been fully implemented in business 22 and 23 with pretty spectacular results. We reduced the time that veterans wait to have their eyeglasses shipped by 53%. Okay, and the staff who are processing those orders we already mentioned are working on other things. And so uh, in the business that have implemented this, we've seen 65% reduction in overall processing time across all prosthetic orders. Uh, this has also helped reduce the number of prosthetic consoles to go past 30 days, which is a national monitor, uh, by 47%. Uh, with the automated process, it ensures that orders are placed in a timely manner next day, regardless of staffing challenges that the individual site might be facing. Right, so this is our uh, landing page for the application. It's pretty simple. After selecting the visit and site, uh, the end user can follow the steps on the left, generate orders, uh, post their billing statements and uh, review their open orders to make sure that they're no better than All right, 
So our process timeline, uh, we were pretty aggressive. We embraced this in the summer of 2017, and by November of the same year, we had a, a stable beta application working at five sites and two visits. Uh, it was already having a tremendous impact for us, and we were excited. So we entered the Shark Tank in 2018, uh, while we completed our rollout, and uh, you know, we just realized there were 1.8 million iPads to be worn every single year, and this would have a huge impact. Uh, we uh, also, uh, we've been able to, since being selected as both status fellows, we spread foresight to 29 sites and four visits, uh, and we've been selected for national implementation. We're very excited about that. So some of the barriers, uh, you know, they've been both predictable and relatively manageable. Uh, as a new application, foresight really needs robust documentation for the end users in the field. We're working with the Fusion of Excellence and with the uh, app to make sure that that's available. Uh, variation eyeglass processes across VA uh, has also been probably our biggest challenge. Uh, there are two things you need in order to implement foresight. One, you have to have uh, the eyeglass console provided to prosthetics ready to order, and that's more of a challenge than you might think. And two, uh, you have to have a contract in place so the vendor will accept a batch order via PKI email. Everything else, you know, pretty much falls in line after that. And recently, especially here, we've been asked, you know, how does survey impact your process? Is this still a viable thing? And uh, you know, we, we can continue to deliver value now, but we've engineered it to be forward compatible, so we can use foresight until we no longer need it. For key metrics, we identified uh, veteran served, orders processed, FTE, uh, productivity gain, and timeliness as our key metrics. And since implementation, we're very excited to say that we've served 283 thousand unique veterans, 331,000 orders, and conservatively, it's like putting four FTE annually into the field every single course. That's 13.1 cumulative FTE. So I want to say thank you very much for this opportunity to share our practice. One of the things I'm most excited about on our site is that this is a homegrown, professionally developed solution to a real problem facing the field. It was, it was real time and you know, it delivered value where it was needed. And this kind of collaboration, forward thinking, and uh, leadership support we received has just been absolutely extraordinary at every single level of the VA. And so we look forward to delivering eyeglasses at a VA near you. Ohio healthcare system. Uh, the practice is devised for accurate and reliable transcranial magnetic stimulation <laughs> resistant to pressure. Okay, so depression is the number one disabling condition worldwide according to the World Health Organization. Unfortunately, 30% of patients do not respond to medication. We call that treatment-resistant depression or medication-resistant depression. One of the treatments that is effective for this condition is called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. TMS is a non-invasive form of brain stimulation that entails using a coil such as this one, which generate very powerful magnetic pulses. These pulses, when they turn on and off, they in turn create electrical fields which can stimulate the brain directly on that coil. When these pulses are applied repetitively, it's called RTMS, and that can result in longer lasting changes of brain activity um, and therapeutic effects. So, in the case of depression, we target the area called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is this mannequin I measured to be right here. So, by design, TMS folds are very focused. So, the area of maximum stimulation is right underneath the center of the coil. And then, as you move away from that in any direction, it drops very rapidly. Especially if you move just a, a few centimeters out from the surface of the coil, you pretty much get to negligible levels. So as a result of TMS being so focused, precision and placement of the coil is very important. The most important factor is that the center of the coil is actually touching the target that you're intending to stimulate. So even if it's off just by a millimeter here, it can result in 40% reduction in stimulation intensity. So this is a very important variable. Some of the other variables, you want the coil to be oriented tangentially. You don't want to tilt it too, too much one way or the other, otherwise you're going to stimulate unintended areas of the brain. And then finally, you want the coil to be angled 45 degrees from this mid-sagittal line. That's just been studied to show to produce the most efficient brain stimulation. 
So how do we do this in clinical practice? It's actually quite crude. Uh, we rely on visual approximation and tools like templates and Sharpie markers to draw the outline of where the coil should be placed. But um, depending on how short you are or how tall you are or what angle you look at it, every time a patient comes in for a treatment, you might place this coil incorrectly, assuming that the original placement was accurate in the first place. And I know this because veterans will tell me every day I come in for a treatment, it feels like the coil is stimulating a different area. Is that impacting efficacy? And there is data showing that uh, incorrect coil placement can negatively impact the therapeutic outcomes. So I thought there's got to be a better way. Right? Um, but if you look at TMS coils since 1985 when they're invented, they haven't really changed very much in their design in terms of user interface or human-centered uh, design approaches. So I, I took advantage of some of the technology that's available to us, uh, in, you know, including sensors and microprocessors and 3D printing to turn an idea into reality, and I came up with this prototype coil, which on, on one side facing the patient will have a bunch, a bunch of sensors essentially to help guide accurate placement, reliable placement of the coil, and then on the side facing the, the treater, a user interface, which can, can tell you directly, are you placing the coil properly? So a quick demo of that. So um, this is a close-up of the screen on the right. If the coil is not making contact with the target, there, there'll be a big red outline, which is bad. And then when you do touch it, it will light up green, and then you'll see a blue dot where the coil is touching the target. You want to write the center because that's where you get maximum stimulation. Next, to tell how, how the coil is angled with respect to the scalp surface, there's a bunch of sensors here which measure the scalp and take out all the guesswork. So there's a little line here which will show you is the coil angled too much to the left, right, or back. And of course, you also want this to be in the center so you get maximum stimulation at the intended target. And then finally, you want the coil to be angled 45 degrees. So I used a, a laser guidance system and an orientation sensor that I can say this is my reference and I want to go 45 degrees from that. And then as I turn the coil, it will, on the top left of the screen, you'll see what angle the coil is, uh, is rotated. And then there, it takes out all the guesswork and errors. Um, finally, these treatments go on 20 to 40 minutes every day, five days a week, four to six weeks. So during this time, the patient's in the chair and the operator is sitting a few feet away. And they're not going to be able to look over you know, the whole time. That would be very intrusive. So I made a little wireless monitor, which would indicate exactly what's going on with the coil contact. So if the patient slides down the chair, coughs, sneezes, you'll be able to um, be informed of that. You can readjust the coil, give the patient optimal TMS every day to come in, and I wrote better outcomes. So, so far, I made the, the prototype, which functions as intended. Uh, Tech Transfer Office has filed for a patent. Um, I'd like to make some revisions uh, based on this prototype of things I'd like to modify and then incorporate it into one of these conventional TMS coils. And then finally, see how does it compare to uh, research grade standard. And I, I anticipate that we'll get better results using more objective coal placement uh, to provide more therapeutic outcomes for the patients suffering from treatment resistant depression. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very well done. You packed a lot in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next we have uh, Kimberly Jones and Robert Smith from VA Boston Healthcare System presenting blood pressure support frame. Good afternoon, everyone. This project is a side project. They came about um, due to a veteran who was coming <coughs> daily to see his primary care physician because he was, was diagnosed with hypertension. Because of his amount of time of travel, parking, getting in and out of the campus, his blood pressure was going up even higher. This is causing frustration, unnecessary medications, but also taking away from primary care, treating other veterans who also needed care. So he was referred to the telehealth program. We met with the veteran and assessed him, and unfortunately, um, we weren't able to help him. So, um, what happened with this veteran is, unfortunately, he's a combat veteran and he lost the use of his arm. And because of this, he was not able to self apply a blood pressure cuff and he did not have a support person with him that could help him do this. Now, um, I know myself, I've gone to multiple retailers and we'll keep 
politics out of it, but um, <laughs> you can go and you see these big chairs in the corner of the store, you slide your arm in, you press a button, it gives you a blood pressure reading within a minute. I'm like, well, there's got to be something out there for this veteran. Extensive market research found nothing out there for a home model. There is a um, office kiosk one to the tune of when I looked at this starting at $2,500, they've now jumped it up to $2,800. And um, we're not practical to put in our veterans' home. We've got a number of our veterans who are coming back, missing limbs, whether it's one, both, partial limb loss. We also have veterans that are older in the generations that are having strokes, have Parkinson's, arthritic issues. So applying this cup is very difficult. Um, for me, I'm a nurse. I can do only so much, but the experts are occupational therapists. So I reached out to Bob, who's in our home-based primary care, and I'll let him take over from here. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Robert Smith, I'm a U.S. Air Force veteran. Uh, I work in whole base primary care where my primary responsibilities are to help folks be able to age at home through adapting and modifying their home environments. When Kim reached out to me, I thought I was just, you know, gonna be trying to make something for one patient. I didn't quite understand the whole innovation experience. Um, <laughs> so eventually, what I came up with, and I, I, I tried first a flat mark that someone might be able to actually mount and, and slide their arm in. And I didn't have success with it. So I went to a tube model, and I tried different size tubes, different lengths, different diameters. Um, trying to problem solve how to allow someone with one arm to be able to get their arm in and then be able to push the button so that they can get a telehealth reading into their primary care physician. Um, I made it in such a way that it could hang, it could clip on, um, you know, there's multiple ways to attach it. And I was thinking if I was going out to this veteran's home, I would be able to figure out a way to be able to mount it. Um, I did hinge open a door because for initial application, it would need to be adjusted to the patient. Um, but once that initial adjustment was completed, uh, through the trials that I did, I found that you could keep it there and actually slide your arm in and get it positioned using just one upward strength to be able to have a grip. The feedback that I got was that they wanted me to make a platform. So I went back into my garage um, and designed just something that you know has a door for storage of the other pieces of the tool and the actual monitor itself. And I put it on Velcro to be able to be mounted. Um, and I know a lot of the patients that I see in home-based primary care have a hospital bed table, an over-the-bed table. And ideally, this would be mounted on that over-the-bed table that be able to slide their arm in, hit the button, and get that reading straight into their primary care position. I'd like to see it made in medical-grade material. <laughs> and uh, it's all real plastic. This would be fine for one person, but I don't have that much time in my go <laughs> So that's where we are now. We've already submitted for the second level for uh, seed, and we're moving on to MIT. Thank you very much. Uh, that's pretty cool. You know, we all know that some of the best innovations come out of garages, so we're going All right, so our next uh, presenter is uh where am i okay elizabeth flodo and james Pittman, center of excellence for stress and mental health presenting va e-screening program technology to improve veteran health care Everyone. <laughs> so, unlike 
some of the other um, talks that you guys have seen today. Um, East training is unique in the fact that it's been over 10 years for making. So East training was first conceptualized in 2018 by um, the research team and Stress and Mental Health in San Diego, and funded by the Innovators Network's predecessor, the VA Center for Innovation. There we go. <laughs> All right, so San Diego is home to the largest naval base on the West Coast, along with seven other military installations. So what this means is that many veterans are discharging so as you can see, there were thousands of veterans discharged in the San Diego um, who had served post-9-11. And VA has several mandates for screening these veterans. So with the number of enrolling combat veterans ever increasing, how can care management and social work services efficiently screen these veterans for their care? Traditionally, people have used methods including um, you know, paper or um, interviewing the patient with a very clinical reminder. And if you're using paper, someone, usually a clinician, has to enter every question and answer into the clinical record. <coughs> so what is e-screening? E-screening is a technology-based um, self-assessment system that has two-way communication with this to CPS. So it can assign the needed health um, reminders and it allows real and staff notification for at-risk veterans. It also has personalized feedback for the veterans and a dynamic progress reporting um, that lets staff and veterans monitor health symptoms over time. The feature that's most requested by most facilities is its robust forms editor that allows it to fit any clinic um, with multiple questions. E-screening uh, can help improve veterans' experience and allow clinicians to practice with their license not just focus on data entry. So we've screened over 10,000 veterans over several years, and in fiscal year 19, in the care management um, program alone in San Diego, we screened over 1,200 veterans. We found that 32% of those folks across even all clinics were endorsing some level of suicidal ideation. And what e-screening allowed clinicians to do was to address those symptoms on the spot by helping the veterans at fire. The technology doesn't just focus on mental health. It's so flexible that you can screen or identify um, food insecurities, um, self-report hearing issues, and a wide variety of other biopsychosocial issues. And over the years, we've used it not only in transition care management, um, but primary care, radiology, and other special needs. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the reach. So far, we have um, been able to implement e screening in five VA sites uh, throughout the country, coast to coast, um, and, and, and um, we are planning on implementing about 15 to 20 sites in fiscal year 20 uh, to, to support some of the efforts that we've done. We've, we've done a lot of research on how best to implement each screening, so we focus a lot on uh, implementation science and methods that we can make sure that when we introduce each screening into a new clinical setting, um, that the, the, the program is accepted in a way that it, it can best fit with the flow for that program. And like Liz mentioned, it's been set up so that it can fit the needs technically of a lot of different programs in terms of their screening assessment. Um, currently, we are um, also working with our VA uh, innovation partners uh, to develop a cloud-based version of e-screening that will allow um, a centralized version for all VA facilities to be able to enter in, uh, to be able to use e-screening. And then when there are changes that we need to make, um, it'll be simple because it'll be to one version of the screen that then gets disseminated out to all the guys. Um, the other thing that we've been doing is working with um, with researchers to actually uh, develop proposals for research projects to uh, facilitate uh, implementation of these screen at a variety of facilities. So some of the lessons that we've learned, uh, and I will say that these lessons have come with um, in the face of many, many very, very difficult barriers, uh, part partially because with any IT is always changing, and as Liz mentioned, it's been going on for a long time. It's right. um, so we've had to keep up with the changes, the technical reason, um, and particularly our program, because we're actually handing um, data to, or we're handing iPads to veterans so that they can come with their own self reported information into the system. Um, but thankfully, through a lot of work with the innovations program, and as well as um, a lot of relationship building and partnerships, um, we've been able to be successful in 
continue this work. Thank you. Once you get that probe on their finger, they have, we've measured their heart rate as well as their saturation. There are multitudes of people who have cold extremities, um, the rooms are cold, causing vasoconstriction, and we're unable to get a reading. Um, my team has, um, even though we, we put the pulse ox on their finger. We put it on their toes, their extra ear lobes, and everywhere, and could not get a reading. So my team at the VA and I have designed a pulse ox probe that is heated. Sorry. That the paramedics in the field on a cold, snowy night the emergency room with patient in shock, the intensive care units with long-term patients that are on ventilators and cannot get readings on them, and just overall care in the cardiac cath lab, as well as the operating rooms, where the rooms are cold to decrease the amount of bacteria growing. This vasoconstriction causes us not to get a reading. Procedures are canceled, delayed, and people are transferred to other institutions in order to get that reading. I myself had a patient who came in for that biopsy. She was a little old lady, and everywhere we put that probe, we could not get a reading. And we had to cancel that procedure and send her to a bigger facility that could be a more enclosed environment and monitor her much care, more carefully. Um, my team at the VA and I have designed this probe, and we have tested 150 of our veterans in the cardiac cath lab doing interventional procedures. We put a regular probe on one hand and a heated probe on the other. We monitored their heart rate, their oxygen levels, and most of all, their comfort. One of our veterans said, could you put it on the other toe? It feels not good. <laughs> Another veteran said, I have Raynaud's disease. Can I have this? Another veteran sent us an email saying that he suffered from burnt lung syndrome from Afghanistan and his doctor needs this to help take care of him. When can he get it? Um, we have received our first patent in 2017. Our international patents are pending in Europe and Canada. And we have several companies that are interested in possibility of licensing. Our probe is designed for maximum simplicity. You open the package, it's heated, the it's air activated, you place it on the finger, and you have results immediately. <coughs> and comfort was the biggest thing that we were worried about. We had zero complaints throughout the entire test. We had multiple cath labs across the VA system send us emails saying, can we be part of your study? Can we have this probe? We need it badly. So it is the possibility of correcting an age-old problem that pulse oximetry began in the 70s, and this has always been a problem. This is what our probe looks like, so that it's open, and the heat source, once you put it on the finger and it closes, it's activated. Along with the Human Engineering Research Laboratory in Pittsburgh, which are the engineers that are amazing, they have designed a heat source for us that we're hoping the heat supply will last between six and eight hours so that we can make it economically sound for hospitals all over the country. Once we have that um, international patent, this will be worldwide 
and we'll be able to take care of better care of our veterans and everyone around the continent. I thank you very much. Next is uh, Lori Venosian and Teresa Buckley, VA Northern California Healthcare System, presenting Remote Veterans Appia Management Platform, also known as Rebank. Good afternoon. I'm Lori Venosian. I'm a neurologist at the VA Northern California and the co director of the SEED program there. And I'd like to thank my colleague, Dr. Teresa Buckley, for preparing today's slides. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about Rebound. This is a web application that helps or really revolutionize the treatment of sleep apnea at the VA. And this is unique because it's both a patient and provider facing uh, web-based application um, that allows people to uh, review their data from their sleep health machines and their sleep apnea testing. Sleep apnea is a breathing problem and is typically treated with CPAP machines. And these machines can monitor whether patients are using them, how well it's working for them. And through revamp, patients can uh, fill out clinical questionnaires that go directly to the clinical provider and can monitor their own CPAP usage uh, as a motivator for them, similar to a Fitbit. The clinician can also see more detailed flowcharts and can adjust the settings remotely over the website. So um, an overview on sleep apnea, the more traditional pathways have involved in-clinic testing and evaluation. Typically, a patient would come to a sleep center, see the physician there, and then spend the night overnight in a sleep lab where they get hooked up with all the wires and sleep there, and then get a CPAP machine and come back into the clinic for follow-up. For the last few years or so, uh, there has been a big shift toward home-based sleep testing, but the overall model has not changed substantially. Patients still come in and see their clinician, but now they take the sleep device home with them and then come back into the clinic for follow-ups and CPAP machine management. And this is still done, um, but now um, with new technology, we've had the advent of wireless modem-based technology to many manufacturers' CPAP machines. And this has allowed both patients and clinicians to manage their data remotely. It gets uploaded onto wireless um, cloud-based um, uh, cloud-based software servers, and each manufacturer has its own website, which allows um, the physician to access it. Um, but it does make for convenient, although somewhat divided care, because there are multiple different brands and different websites that people have to deal with. Um, so this has allowed, this technology has allowed us to integrate kind of all of it, the home-based testing, the wireless modem technology, into a telesleep comprehensive program that basically allows everything from initial evaluation down to the treatment and CPAP management to happen away from a medical facility and in the comfort of the patient's home using telehealth technology. So a patient can be seen and evaluated by a clinician over revamp and fill out a comprehensive host of questionnaires that are all online for the provider. Um, they can have an evaluation over video, camera, or telephone with the clinical provider. Um, the home testing unit can be mailed to the patient and mailed back to the VA. And then when they get to their CPAP machine, the management can um, go on to a centralized website over rebound that pulls in data from all of the different brand manufacturers. And uh, the beauty of it is that, again, it's a two-way interface. It has a very simple interface for patients to look at their own data as well as a more complex, interactive uh, face for the clinical provider. And Rebound allows for secure HIPAA-compliant single sign-on uh, logins with a PIB card for the clinician and with, uh, through My Healthy Vet for the veteran. Uh, it, it contains a master veteran index, which pulls in all the demographic patient data. It has a secure messaging interface, so patients can uh, actually email their providers about their CPAP machines. Um, and uh, it also integrates with several of the different brand manufacturers. Um, and in the future, the next step is to integrate it with prosthetics uh, for automated resupply ordering of all the CPAP supplies. And so Telesleep has overall really transformed care for the VA, uh, both to make it more convenient and affordable for veterans and providers, both for the clinical evaluation, the home diagnostic testing, and the CPAP management of patient care, all in one easy-to-use and secure website. 
Um, and so to borrow a quote from the National Archives building, um, they, uh, they, uh, they, um, they say that the past is prologue, and so revamp is the next chapter. Thank you. Uh, so next word we have Frank Zitko uh, from the VA in Northeast Ohio Healthcare System, presenting the design of non-hydraulic self-level <coughs> water so safe stair climbing. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Frank Zitko. Um, I'm a biomedical engineer and innovation specialist uh, in Cleveland, and I'm here representing uh, the team from Cleveland for the self. So imagine you're a veteran in the hospital suffering from um, maybe an orthopedic injury or an amputation, um, and you have trouble walking and require a walker for your day-to-day your -day life, um, but you have some steps getting into the home or inside your home or in, in commonly uh, travel to community spots, um, what is your solution? Um, Mobility is a key component to any rehab goal. Um, so the ability to navigate stairs um, often delays patients from returning home um, as a result of uh, not being able to navigate stairs. Um, so this can often lead to extended hospital stays and rehab visits uh, and, and further care. So our self going walker addresses the limitations of conventional walkers uh, in that the front legs retract by the same length that the rear legs extend creating a stable uh, four-point base when ascending stairs. So since we last spoke to you uh, last demo day, uh, we were in the midst of completing our uh, FY18 spread where we piloted the device at three different medical centers um, with 47 different veterans. Um, we recorded uh, metrics like ease of use and, state and safety, and um, at a certain point, Likert scale, they scored moderately safe and moderately easy to use, and compared to other standard methods of care, um, this was at or exceeded um, what, those, uh, what those solutions were. So we were pleased to see that. I'd say the lion's share of the work from this past year was um, being selected into the i program, which is a statewide program in Ohio, um, mainly with academic uh, partners um, where they really want to dig into the problem and solution um, to make sure that there's a fit with your technology. So this involved um, interviewing over 100 different uh, customers. And at the beginning of this, we weren't sure who our customer was. Was it an end user? We're pretty sure of that. Is it a clinician who prescribes the device? Is it a distributor who's ultimately selling it? We didn't know. So to get those answers, we spoke to everybody and talked to over 100, 100 of those folks. So really, one of the foundations of the i program is really nailing down your value proposition. Um, so on the right, you'll kind of see your, your problem from a customer standpoint, um, the jobs they need to do, uh, the gains, so the positives that come as a result of getting the job done, um, or pains, uh, some of the, the pains that come as a result of not getting the job done. So really identifying those when it comes to steering negotiation was, was the first step. And then the left is really what our product delivers. So really identifying the features that create some of these gains and relieve some of these pains to ensure that um, you have a problem solution with it. So ultimately we decided that we did and we moved forward. Um, we took a lot of those insights that we gained from the i program to iterate uh, and re redesign the walker uh, for this coming year. So we actually just got our prototype delivery last week, so I couldn't quite sneak it on the plane with me uh, here, but um, basically we really wanted to take cost out. So one of the big pieces of all this was that um, we needed to prepare for out-of-pocket pay. So it's not so relevant to the VA, but again, scaling this uh, into something larger, we want to account for people that may need to pay for this out-of-pocket. So we wanted to reduce costs, um, reduce the weight, reduce the, the long-term weight of the device. Um, so we did. Um, so we're going to go and continue to evaluate that this coming year by gathering some clinical feedback similar to what we did in our FY18 spread. Um, maybe add some other uh, uh, features like adding wheels, some of the other things that we identified in i that would make it a minimally viable product. 
Um, and ultimately, the final step we hope this year is to really get that buy-in from industry. So hopefully, identify a manufacturer who will uh, ultimately uh, we can license the technology to, uh, and they commercialize it for us. So I'm happy to say that we are in uh, negotiations with a potential licensee. So um, that's very exciting for us. Um, to work uh, the past couple of years to get to where it is today. So that's what I have. Thank you. Well done, thank you. Okay, next we have Steve Warren from um, Minneapolis BAF Care System presenting Swing Shift, Unit Planner, Variable Drive Ratio, Wheelchair, Push Around Assembly. That's quite a <laughs> uh, Robert, you seem pretty humble about your shop. Pretty, I'm not real keen on that. I'm standing behind Pulling the saw, stand over here. We have a saying in our lab group, the main group in Minneapolis. It's not high tech, it's not low tech, it's the right tech. So, I, I apply your work. Nice job. Um, this idea came about, let's see, right button was it? There we go. Sling shift. Wheelchairs haven't changed much. I've got on the uh, left over here, grab my pointer. Over here, I got a patent from 1894, and if you take a look at the ones that are sitting in your outpatient entrance, they haven't changed much in a hundred years. So, there's a lot of room for innovation in there. We had a, uh, wheelchairs are a really useful tool, but they still have some problems. Uh, the ADA Act of uh, 1980, I believe it was, lowered a lot of barriers. We've got, now we put curb cuts, so you don't have to curb hop with your wheelchair. We've got a ramp to get in. So that step climbing walker is a great innovation, but if you're in a chair, now we can even get our wheelchairs up. Holy mackerel, look at that ramp. <laughs> That's a heck of a ramp. That's a long ways to go. Well, let's go. We've got a low-tech device here called the grade A, and that just connects the back of the chair. You flip it on, and now when you let go of the push rooms, you don't coast downhill going up that ramp. That's a great innovation. This is a great tool. A little bit about VMA. We don't do just wheelchairs, we don't do just prosthetics. We are truly multidisciplinary. We'll look at everything. If you take a look at all those photos, I'll be happy to talk about any of them or any of the devices at the 3D printing table later uh, tomorrow. But let's get back to wheelchairs. VMA does have a lot of notoriety in the wheelchair community in our uh, manual standing wheelchairs. I'm defining a remote drive wheelchair is where the drive chains and the push rims, the wheels are detached from the drive wheels. And you can see that here. Going to the next page. Uh, let's go ahead. I don't have my scanning picture, but that's all right. So we're looking at, as soon as we started hanging bike chains on wheelchairs, people went, you guys should put a derailleur system in like a 10 speed bike. We never thought of that. That's great. The problem is how you shift when you're pushing. Keep in mind that everybody had a 10 speed bike when you're battling. You change that when you move and shift. If your hands are pushing, what do you shift with? So, well, how about a torque converter? Those work really well. As anybody who rides a snowmobile or an ATV can attest, they are a great tool. The problem is, you got a hundred, couple, uh, couple of horsepower driving that belt. They are huge friction losses of that. We need to think differently. We need something that doesn't do that. Oh, one more downside to derailers, they don't work in reverse. Nobody can have it backwards on a bicycle. You see wheelchair users do it all the time. So the sling shift is actually a pretty simple device. Um, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to step away from the podium because I hate them. You're rolling along. You've got a simple device. You guys on the side are going to have a hard time. You guys down here in the middle are going to have a really good view. You hit an obstacle as you're rolling along. I'm just put my curb cut in. If you're a diminished strength user or you have limited mobility, you're not going to get a lot of strength. You're going to hit an obstacle, and it's just like getting a wall. The advantage of this is if you take a look at what's happening to the sprocket right here as I go through that obstacle. Take a look at this chain tension up. Can you see the sprocket moving? The sprocket is moving, the, the gears are But now, this sprocket, the distance from here to the center, is significantly lower. What we've done is given you a longer lever on your push ramp, giving you a bigger push ramp. Without sacrificing any movement, all you've done is continue pushing. 
get back on level grade with back to your original year ratio. So I'm back to my slides. What we're going to do in our next phase, this is just the proof of concept. These are just gas dampers. There's no spring force to these springs. So what you're seeing right now in off center is a phenomenon called torque rack. Um, with a spring gas damper, I'll be able to bring these back to center just by the spring force. So now when you let go of the push trim, it'll return to neutral without having me have to help it. That's the advantage of our employment test. The picture up above is a wheelchair simulator. 2020, we're going to put these push rims on that simulator. That was a little big to haul around. So that's actually a, a full-size platform. You put a user in on these pins right here. You mount your wheelchair push rims, and it works just like a <coughs> wheelchair rolling along. You've got weight to tell us how much work you're putting out. So we're going to measure it out. We're going to find out if this contraption actually does give us the mechanical benefit. But with human-centered design, the risk is small and fail small. If it turns out that it doesn't work, I'll quick move on to something else and end up this way. Thank you for your time. So, thank you. All right, so next we have Billy Sturter, again, uh, from Minneapolis VA Healthcare System, uh, presenting the Veteran Amputee, a prosthetic sock management tool for fit and comfort.
a partner in prosthetics. So we harness the strength of what our VA can do. First of all, partnering with prosthetics to actually make the PSMTs as they're called. Um, partnering also again with medical media. Uh, they evaluated and then approved this infographic for use in our veteran population. But before even getting to this point, we engaged uh, with the three different stakeholder groups. <coughs> the veteran mentors, asking about opinions, concerns, uh, making the prototypes, having them evaluate the, those initial prototypes. Also meeting with the clinicians, OT, PT, physiatrists, uh, prosthetists, prosthetics, technicians, everyone who wanted to weigh in um, down in the prosthetics area we met, we uh, discussed all of these components in great detail, and finally came up with this product that we decided to um, bring to our veterans. So the great news, three veterans um, have received the PSMT. I'd like to talk about two of them. The first veteran, when he went to his clinic appointment, I asked him, what did you think of the PSMT? He said, I love the place now. <laughs> he met this. He keeps it on his kitchen table. He's been using it. When it happened, he had been using it for two weeks. He had healed the open and bleeding wound on the bottom of his limb by using uh, correct use of the prosthetic sock management tool. The other veteran used the ultimate excuse by saying, My dog ate the PSMT. His puppy consumed it. But before the dog had a chance to eat the PSMT, the veteran said, it was reasonable, easy to use. I got the gist of how to use my prosthetic socks. And they liked the colors and the pictures on the, on, he didn't call the placement, on the infographic. So we're happy to have the chance um, to move forward with this project and bring the PSMT out into VA clinics this coming year. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, all right, next we have Mark Lamin uh, from VHA Public Health Surveillance and Research Program Office presenting VA Public Health Technology Suite. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Aladni, and I direct the BHA National Public Health Office. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is, first of all, who are we and what we do. Uh, since we're a national program office, we actually conduct public health and epidemiologic investigations um, as required by BHA leadership or the Office of Inspector General or by Congress. We um, also do uh, continuous public health surveillance across all VA, uh, and that takes many different uh, forms, um, looking at things in terms of post-hurricane uh, activities and events, uh, when the Zika outbreak came out, or monitoring influenza across the VA on a seasonal basis. We also provide subject matter expertise, um, both to uh, individuals at VA medical centers and serve as a liaison to public health departments and to CDC and to some of our DOD partners. And then finally, we have a clinical and public health laboratory, um, this is out in Palo Alto where our field office is, uh, where we um, test samples for public health investigations uh, and also do clinical testing. So the consequence of all of this work uh, is pretty data intensive and requires a lot of data management in order for us to actually do our work. So to that end, um, we require certain software applications to actually do the work. And the work, uh, the need is really to have uh, the ability to access data from all VA medical centers, uh, to be able to grab it, uh, to be able to map it, uh, to be able to use natural language processing to extract data out of encounters, all of that um, 
uh, is a requirement in the office. So we partnered um, with a, a vendor out in California called this uh, to put a software application in the VA called Predico. And that's a cost solution, a commercial off-the-shelf product that's available for public health surveillance and allows us uh, to be able to look at data that we extract twice a day and produce queries as necessary for the public health event of interest. Uh, we can store those queries and analyze uh, those queries um, whenever we need to. And by utilizing an automated program like this, uh, it's really significantly reduced the amount of time that we have to use in order to uh, do these complex queries with the epidemiologists who work for me. And it, it, it we're also able to ingest a variety of different data formats um, from our DOD colleagues or from social media to enhance the type of surveillance that we actually do. Uh, in terms of some of the public health laboratory work that we do, you can imagine uh, getting samples in is fairly complex from across the VA system. We get clinical samples in every day from over 90 VA medical centers. We have to keep track of those, account for them, uh, process them, test them, primarily for complex uh, infectious disease tests, uh, but we're now expanding into precision oncology testing and looking at the human uh, genome sequences as well. So to do this all by hand would be impossible. Uh, and we have another product that we've also installed called Predigene. And that allows us to simplify a lot of the workflow, uh, barcode reading of all of the samples, uh, allows us to have a, a pretty smooth flow of how the samples go through the laboratory and also report the results back to the medical center, either in a PDF format or through the laboratory exchange data system that VA has uh, back to the uh, referring site. The other important um, attribute of this is it allows us to do billing back to the referring site, which has been extremely problematic across VA to do this. So working with the chief financial officer um, office at the VA, uh, we have the ability to uh, do this in a much more streamlined uh, fashion. Uh, the last product I wanted to just mention is not one that we use, but it is installed out in VISN 21 uh, that the anesthesiologists and the critical care uh, physicians use to improve their uh, ability to look at quality indicators uh, that they are responsible for at the medical centers out in VISN 21. So another product installed called Predicare uh, has allowed the anesthesiologists to uh, be able to uh, do their work in a much more timely fashion uh, and improve the quality significantly. The last thing I just want to mention is that in order to make all of this work, uh, we have to be able to get all that data from all the VA medical centers and we've been able to successfully create a big data platform to, to that uh, can actually ingest all of this and allow these three particular software packages to work uh, in a streamlined fashion. Thank you very much for your time. All right, so for our final presentation, we have Scott Damrower from Corporal Michael J. Prisons VA Medical Center and the VA Lady Center Program, presenting Leveraging VA Data and DOE Computing to Develop New Models to Predict Cardiovascular Disease, VA MVP, MVP DOE CBD Exemplar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Scott Damrower, I'm a vascular surgeon at uh, VA Um, and I'm going to talk about something very different than everything you've heard of so far today, which is something that's much more in the research phase. And this came out of a interdepartmental government collaboration between the VA and the Department of Energy, which, when, when it started, was pretty unique in trying to do what we were looking at. And so I'm speaking really on behalf of people at Hello Alto VA, Boston VA, Atlanta VA, and the Argonne National Labs, Oak Ridge, and uh, Los Angeles. So. In a very large group. As, as people may or may not know, cardiovascular disease is actually the leading cause of death, both in the United States and worldwide. Uh, 
And when we think about cardiovascular disease, the two cardiovascular diseases that people pay a lot of attention to are heart attack and stroke. And those are the things that we become really interested in predicting. But more broadly, there's a whole host of different types of heart and vascular disease that we just look at in the mortality. The way we traditionally think about whether or not someone is at risk for vascular disease and what to do about that in a clinical setting is based on risk calculators. And this is probably the most common we use risk calculator, which is put together um, through a whole ton of data collected by the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology. And basically what it does is it takes your age, sorry, it takes your sex, takes your race, combines in your cholesterol, uh, whether you have diabetes and whether you uh, have high blood pressure or high blood pressure medications, and whether you smoke, and then tells us what it thinks your absolute risk of developing heart attack, stroke, or dying from cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years are. And then we use that to think about what kind of medications you need to be on or other things about your health to try to impact. Recently, there's been a lot of interest in trying to use genetics to help think about what diseases people are going to get. And one of the approaches that's gained the most traction is something called polygenic risk scores. So this is basically taking all of the different places that humans differ in terms of their DNA and their genes, and using studies that have looked at how those relate to certain diseases, and then applying them to people and summing up across all of those different places, the little tiny effects of each different variation of DNA to get a score that has some predictive capacity. And a number of different groups have published in relatively um, impressive papers looking at how people who have the highest genetic risk also have the most disease, and how when you look at a genetic risk score, which is kind of here, it actually outperforms the ability to predict disease compared to any of the traditional risk factors. This is all of the traditional risk factors, the ones I talked about before, together. And this is all of the traditional risk factors plus the genetics. So there's pretty good evidence that adding the genetics to your traditional risk factors really can help us understand better disease. So this then works on top of the VA Million Veteran Program. So the VA Million Veteran Program was a program started in 2011 when we enrolled the first patient by the Office of Research and Development with the ambitious goal of enrolling million veterans and linking biospecimens, of which we did DNA analysis to look at all the genetic variation to the electronic health record. And it built on what is a long history of a very robust electronic health record in the VA. There's currently 750,000 or more veterans enrolled in the program, and it actually makes it one of the largest resources of this kind in the world. So it's an area where the VA foresight has really established it at the extreme end of innovation in genetics. And so, we were really interested in thinking about how we could couple this with the electronic health record data and come up with new ways to predict how veterans' um, risk for cardiovascular disease is. So we combined forces with the uh, Department of Energy and really capitalized on a lot of clinical expertise with data and genetics in the VA and the fact that the DOE has tons of computing resources and tons of expertise with respect to handling large data. And basically what we're doing, and we're still very much in the early days, is asking if um, we define a population of people and when they enroll into the Million Veterans Program, can we predict disease over time? And how does it compare if we use traditional models as compared to traditional models plus genetics? Or kind of all of these really innovative machine learning, artificial intelligence approaches that our colleagues at the DOE are experts on. Um, and ultimately, the goal is something like this, although I imagine it'll look different because it would be sooner by that time. Um, but basically, a tool that would, in the background, integrate all of these signals, and then two clinicians present a clinical support, support this clinical decision tool to say, hey, your patient is at high risk. We notice you're not on this medication. We recommend you be on this medication. Thanks, uh, uh, genetic research and testing is, is fascinating. It's a lot. Mike Warren there, so appreciate it. Uh, so I'm going to close out with some closing remarks. So thank you to the uh, presenters. Thank you. Thank you.
I'd like to remind everyone to tweet or post about your favorite innovation experience demo using the DHA Innovation Experience app. Don't forget to attend the awards ceremony tomorrow, Wednesday, October 23rd, starting at 4 30 p.m. in the ballroom. One demo from each track will be selected to receive an award. Uh, also, tomorrow, the day will kick off with the opening of the Experience Center at 8 a.m. Come see 3D printers in action and other incredible exhibits. Join us tomorrow to see more innovation experience presentations in the morning and afternoon. And finally, on a personal note, I want to thank all the veterans here for your service. And thank you, Chair of the House, in this room for supporting our veterans and doing what you do on a daily basis. Have a great time. Thank you. 